And uh, could we stand this good morning and let us trust the good Lord this morning who has brought you from the north, the south, the east and west. And we're going to trust God with you today that the Lord is going to touch your hearts, stir you up. And uh, let's, let's lift up our hands to the living God. Father God, this morning, we give you this conference. This Connect Conference, and we pray and we thank you that, Father, every leader that is present here, every man and woman that has come to say, Lord, here I am to serve. We pray today, Father, that you would impart and build your church. We thank you, Lord, that leaders would leave you inspired, touched, edified, built up in the things of God. For there is a nation that needs saving. There are the lost that are going to hell. And you want to build your church, God. You want to use us to stir. You want to use us to bring change. You want to use us, oh God, to make an impact in this nation for your glory, we pray. Touch us this morning. Stir within us, God. Bless your people, your leaders, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone who loved God, believed God, said amen. Here we go. Are you ready to worship God this morning? Here we go. Yes, hallelujah. We bless your name, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name.
fight the battle for you and me. Amen. Amen. Is the one. Let's praise him, God. Nothing can stand 
Amen. Hallelujah. Can we make some noise in this place? Can we lift up the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we shout again? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Again, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Just greet the person next to you, behind you. Let's give the love of Jesus in this place. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for each and every person in this auditorium. Thank you for your love in our hearts this morning. Thank you for the privilege that we have to come together as the saints of God. The Ecclesia. Can I see, are you part of the Ecclesia? The gathering of the saints this morning. Amen. And we know and understand that when the children, the saints come together, there's power in this house this morning. Amen. So I hope that you came with an expectancy that God is going to do great things this morning. Before I welcome you and the speakers, I just want to read the scripture because we need to understand what, what this day is about. And quickly read with me 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1 and 2. He says, as God's co-workers, can I see? Are we God's co-workers? Amen. We're working with God. Amen. We are called by God. Each and every one of you are called by God. You are loved by God. You are called by your name this morning. And then Paul writes, he says, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. I want to remind you that this morning is not in vain. I want to tell you that God has got an appointment with you this morning. Maybe you were invited. Some of you may be forced to come this morning, but I want to tell you God has got a, an appointment with you. Don't take it for, for vanity. God has got an appointment with you. Be ready this morning. Then he says further, he says, don't take it for vain. He says, and in the, for he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. I want to tell you that God has heard your prayers. And we know that when he hears our prayers, he answers our prayers. And he says, in the day of salvation, I have helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Believe it today that today is the day of salvation for you. Believe it today that God is going to answer your prayers. Amen. And the scripture says He's here to help one of each and every one of us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you for your anointing, God, that breaks the yokes this morning. We want to welcome you, Holy Spirit, before we welcome our people and our speakers this morning. It's all about you, Jesus Christ. It's all about our Father in heaven, and it's all about the Holy Spirit. And we want to pray our desires that the name of Jesus will be lifted up in this place, God. Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts again. Come and restore. Come and do today, Lord, what you have planned for every person, every leader, every pastor, God. We pray for breakthroughs this morning, God. We pray for answered prayers this morning. We pray, Lord, that the chains of Satan will be broken over people this morning. That people will be set free this morning through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, come and ignite the hearts of every pastor and every leader this morning. As we praise you and as we worship you this morning. Amen. Can we give God a praise? You can quickly take your seat, quickly take your seat. We are so privileged this morning, first of all, to welcome the Spirit Wind team and the speakers all across the sea, amen, all across the ocean from America. Can we give them a hand? Dr. John Bosman, thank you so much that you brought your team, and uh, Dr. John is going to take the first session, and we are excited and we are expected, amen, to hear the Word of God this morning. Also, uh, Reverend George Sawyer, can we give him a hand? Thank you so much, Pastor George, that you came to South Africa to bless the South Africans. And then also, uh, John Jr., Pastor John Jr., John Bosman's son, welcome. John, always a pleasure to receive you. And also, also his two boys are here. Can we give them a hand? Can we welcome them in the house? Reverend Juan Rivera, welcome this morning. Thank you so much that you are here to bless us. And uh, we know that 
God has spoken to you, and we know that God is going to use you in a mighty way this morning, and we are privileged today. Are we privileged, people? We are so privileged to have them here, and they didn't come with any expectation. They said, Ronaldo, Dr. John said, Ronaldo, we are just here to bless our pastors. We are here to serve them this morning. They didn't come with a lot of requests. No, they came to bless you. Amen. Are you ready to receive a blessing this morning? Are you ready? Are you ready? Can you stand up again? And I want to just thank all of our leaders and our pastors. Thank you for your support for Pastor Ronnie. Unfortunately, Pastor Ronnie, he would have loved to be here this morning. But thank you that through your prayers, every day Pastor Ronnie is becoming stronger. Amen. Because we know that the prayer of a righteous man and woman will availeth much. Amen. And we trust God that he will be stronger than ever. But thank you that you are filling the gap this morning. Amen. Because if you would have asked Pastor Ronnie, his desire today is, is that you are here praising God. Amen. And filling the gap and standing together as leaders. Before we're going to praise and worship, just put your hand on your brother and sister and speak a blessing over them. Lord Jesus, as we heard your word, God, thank you that you will touch every person. As we put our hands on our brothers and sisters this morning, before we're going to worship, Lord, touch every soul, touch every mind, touch every heart in this place this morning. As we worship, as we lift up the name of Jesus, you will draw us close to you, close to the Father's heart, Lord. Thank you that you are the way maker this morning. You are the promise keeper. Thank you, Lord, that you will affirm callings. Thank you, Lord, that you will affirm visions this morning. Touch every person in this place, we pray, as we worship God. Amen. Thank you, Tommy. you believe that God has worked with you Amen. throughout all the challenges God has worked with you hallelujah
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Jesus. Yes. your name I was made to praise you Lord to worship you Distraction 
is set on you. My devotion, Jesus, my portion, my affection is set on you.
want you to just lift your hands for a moment. It's just worship. It's worshiping this morning. It's just welcoming to this place this morning. The shins are quite holy, holy, holy. He's God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We praise your name, Jesus. We worship you this morning, oh God. We lift up your wonderful name, Jesus. We praise your name. Oh, we worship your Lord. Amen. Can I ask, can we change the program a little bit? Let's sing with Alpha and Omega. He is the first, He is the last. He is the beginning and He is the end. Amen. Yes, Jesus. Let's just worship Him. You are Alpha. Can we give the Lord a praise in this church? He is the Alpha and He is the Omega. We give Him praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Give the Lord one more praise as you take your seats. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, servants of God, our first speaker this morning is Dr. John Bosman. I want you to give him a warm Connect conference welcoming today as he comes up to share the Word of God with us all the way from America.
What an honor it is to have him here with his Spirit Wind team. And uh, Dr. John, God bless you. Thank you very kindly, Pastor Basil. What a delight to be back at Word and Life in Boxburg, be back in South Africa again, knowing that God is a good God. Well, I know that you can say that better than that. I said God is a good God. And our God is an awesome God. Our God is a mighty God. He's an unchanging God. He's an unfailing God. He is the never, ever changing God. He is the resurrection and the life. He is our power and He is our strength. I said our God is a good God. There never has been a God like our God. Never has been, never will be because our God is the creator God. He created everything. He spoke everything into existence. And as he spoke it into existence, everything came about. Your Bible says, in the beginning, God. Well, I've got to tell you, before the beginning was there, God was already there. Because God did not begin when the beginning began. He began the beginning. God didn't start when start God started. He started, start. He is the great I am. God came from nowhere because there was nowhere to come from. And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And standing on nothing, he got a hold of something. He commanded it to stay there, and he did. Why? Because he is God. I said, he is God. There is no other God. There never has been. There never will be. He is the one that flung the stars into space like glittering diamonds on a black velvet black. He is the one that dripped the perfume into the rose. He is the one that brought sweetness to the peach. He is the one that brought power to the seed. He is the one that brought life that would never end. He is God. I said he is God. There is no other God like our God. He is the creator God. He slapped his hands on this earth when he lay raised it up out of the mud mountains existed. He took his feet and slid it over the face of the earth and rivers were formed to carry the water to the ocean. He made the difference between night and day. He is the great creator. He is the mighty God. He is alive and he will be God forever. Why don't we give him a shout of praise? Come on, give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. I'm not preaching yet. I'm just saying hello. So good to see all of you. If I look over the sea of faces, I recognize some. and I realize that all of us are not teenagers anymore. But I so appreciate to see so many of you that I do recognize. Others that I uh, do not recognize, but I love you dearly. Uh, and I want to appreciate you for coming. Uh, thank you for making the sacrifice to be here on a Tuesday morning. May the Lord bless you abundantly. I want to say, first of all, with a sad heart, that Pastor Ronnie is not here. But I want to honor Pastor Ronnie Barman, as a great man of God. His presence here today is sorely missed. I have to tell you, I've known Pastor Ronnie for many, many years, and I can say with conviction, he is one of the greatest men of God that I have ever met. Pastor Ronnie Barnett is a man of the word. 
He's a man of the spirit. He's a man of integrity. He's a man of vision. And the list goes on. I do believe that Pastor Ronnie Barnard is going to get up from where he is right now. And he is going to become a more powerful man of God than he has ever been. If you believe that, say a good amen. amen. Pastor Ronnie, I don't know if you're listening in. But if you are, thank you, my friend. Thank you for your life. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your sacrifice. This whole gathering today wants you to know we are praying for you. As a matter of fact, let's pray right now. Everybody lift your hands, lift your voices, and begin to pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that the Holy Spirit will fill Pastor Ronnie's room right now. Let the Holy Spirit fill that room, flood into his life, and speak the miraculous power of God in the name of Jesus. Let him rise from that bed. Let him rise out of those circumstances. Let him become a greater giant than he has ever been. We speak blessing over your servant, Father, in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you very kindly, Pastor Ronaldo, your team, for putting together this wonderful conference. Uh, it took a lot of work between you, Pastor Basil, and the rest of the st staff and the team to get all of these people together. I want to say how very blessed we are to see how many people you were able to gather on short notice. Thank you very much, Pastor Ronaldo. Thank you for your staff. Thank you for the team. Thank you for everybody. May the Lord bless you. Yes, let's give them a hand of appreciation. I know Pastor Ronaldo has already uh, announced a team. I just want to quickly ask them to stand one by one. First of all, Pastor Juan Rivera, right over here, hailing from Puerto Rico, now in Ohio, USA. And then Pastor George Sawyer from Alabama. And then I'm going to ask my older son, John. And then his older son, John. And I know that you know my, my name is John. So uh, I want you to understand that we are very, very biblical. First John, second John, and third John. <laughs> then on his left hand side is Andrew, second oldest son. Right over here. Sitting with the camera is my, our younger son, Jace. Many of you may remember him as Hannes, but that's, that's Jace. Welcome, team. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your sacrifices. God bless you. I want you to turn to your notes, please, as we begin our teaching. I want to begin by reading the scripture to you that we're going to focus our attention on this morning. Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. Dear brothers and sisters, 
I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach, this is Paul speaking, is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source. And no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by His marvelous grace. Then it pleased Him to reveal His Son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. And when this happened, this is so important, and when this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away to Arabia. And later, I returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at that time was James, the Lord's brother. I declare before God that what I am writing to you is not a lie. After that visit, the visit to Jerusalem, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia. And still the churches in Christ that are in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that Paul was, uh, that people were saying, the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, in these verses, Paul briefly relates to the Galatians his conversion experience on the Damascus Road, and he especially describes the journey of how God led him from that point forward. He describes some very definite experiences on this journey, the journey that he had made to take before he could become what the Lord had in mind for his life. And can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, most all of us have to take on a journey to, to reach the place where God really wants us to be. We don't get there overnight. We don't reach full fulfillment overnight. It takes time. It takes a journey. And in these verses, Paul made clear to them that he had received his calling from God and not from man. And that the message he was preaching was not given to him by the apostles or any of the other believers, but that the message he was preaching he received from the master himself. In his discourse, he relates how he violently persecuted the church and tried his best to destroy it. But at that point in time, he had not known that Jesus had made a declaration. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And if you're following along in your note outline, each one of you should have received the note outline booklet. Follow along with me in, in your booklet. Now, Paul, on his life journey, came to four very distinct places. 
I hope you have a pen or a pencil with you because you're going to see that there are some blanks uh, left in my outline, and I will give you the words to fill in as I proceed. Now, these places that Paul visited meant four very important experiences, and we are going to visit those four places briefly and apply it to our personal life journey. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you and be a help to you as you develop the journey that you are on. Regardless of your age, regardless of your position, regardless of where you are, I believe that God still has a journey and a plan for you. If you are breathing this morning, it is a clear indication that God is not done with you yet. Every person in this room today, you're on a journey and God wants you to get to your place of complete fulfillment. Point number one says that that Damascus is the first stop on the journey that Paul is mentioning to us. So this first encounter Paul had with, with Christ was on the Damascus Road, and we see more about that in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 16. This is where he was confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ and this is where he surrendered his life. It is amazing to me that divine revelation all, always starts with confrontation. I want to say that again. Divine revelation always starts with confrontation. God confronts us with a challenge. Confronts us with a great vision. God confronts us with great purpose. And it's this revelation that will be brought forth because of the confrontation that we have had with God in a particular sense. Now, this morning, we will call Damascus the place of surrender. So the word you want to fill in there is the word surrender. You will hear me every time before there's a blank to be completed. I will pause, and I will most of the times repeat it. So we will call Damascus the place of surrender. If this moment, please listen to me. If the moment of surrender did not happen in Paul's life. Paul would never have become the instrument God made him to become. Please listen to me. If Paul had not come to the place of surrender, he would never have become the man that God had made him to become. And we all have to realize that we have to come to a place of surrender. And if we don't come to a place of surrender, we will never be able to become the vessels He desires us to be. And we don't only surrender in the beginning of our lives. We don't only surrender in the beginning of our ministries. We have to surrender to God all the time. And especially when he gives us a new assignment, it always has to start, start with surrender, bowing down to the will of Almighty God. And many times that is exactly the place where we lose it. We don't want to surrender to the complete will of God. We surrender to the part that we appreciate, but we do not want to surrender to the tough things. Even Jesus himself had to come to a place of surrender. Look at Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. It's not in your notes. I'm just giving you extra material. If he had not surrendered in Gethsemane, you and I would not have been saved today. 
If Jesus did not surrender, we would not have been forgiven of our dreadful sin. And if Paul had not experienced this place of surrender on the Damascus Road, we would not have had all the insightful letters that were written to the churches to help us guide us through the day. We use that to this very day. Why? Because Paul surrendered. Our victories, listen to me, church, our victories are gained at the place of surrender. I want to say that again. Our victories are gained at the place of surrender. Gethsemane was the place of surrender for Jesus. And it was in Gethsemane where the victory was gained. Calvary was the rounding off of the victory. But if it, Jesus had not surrendered in Gethsemane, there would not have been a crucifixion, and there would not have been a resurrection, and there would not have been salvation for humankind. Our victories are gained at the place of surrender. Surrender, in your notes, is when I realize I cannot do anything on my own. And we declare boldly today, without Him, we can do nothing. Surrender is when I, when I give up my agenda. I'm back in your notes again. When I give up my agenda, my dreams, my ideals, my will, that I experience the peace of God. When I let go of my own preferences, my pride, my pride, my ego, my human thinking, that I realize that all that remains is my desire to make a difference for Christ and His kingdom. Because listen to me, it was when Jesus Christ at the place of surrender was willing to pay the price that God honored him. It is when Paul on the Damascus road was willing to pay the price of surrender that God crowned him to become the apostle to the Gentiles. It's on the Damascus Road, the place of surrender, my brother and sister, that you have a choice. Please listen to me. You can choose to surrender to the will of God and arrive at your glorious destiny, or you can choose to rebelliously continue on your own and pay the bitter consequences. God will let you choose for yourself. God won't force you to do anything. He won't make you do anything. He has created you and me with a prerogative to decide for ourselves. Surrendering most likely in your notes, surrendering does not come easy. Can I say that again? Surrendering does not come easy. And it doesn't come without risk. I said it doesn't come without risk. Just because you have surrendered does not mean that all is well. After you have surrendered, there is oftentimes great opposition because the enemy knows that if you are going to fully surrender to God and you are going to function in the perfect will of God, it's going to mean trouble for him and the fallen angels. So please listen to me. If you want to write this down, please listen to me when I say this to you. Simply being in the will of God 
does not mean you will never face the storms of life. I want to say that again. Simply being in the will of God does not mean you will never face the storms of life. You can be in the center of the will of God and things may still go wrong. And that does not mean you're out of the will of God. It simply means the enemy of your soul and the enemy of your family and the enemy of your ministry is trying to stop you right there, right in the beginning. So when trouble comes, don't say that's not the will of God. God, simply obey your moment of surrender. The disciples, Luke chapter 4, Jesus says to them, let's go to the other side. And at the command of Jesus, they set sail for the other side. But on their way there in the middle of the night, in the middle of the of the Sea of Galilee, a storm arises and threatens to destroy them. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a trick question. I want you to shout out the answer. Who told the disciples to go to the other side? Uh, some of you still thought that was a trick question. Those of you said, Jesus, good for you, right answer. So let me ask the question again. Who told the disciples to go to the other side? Jesus. And in spite of the fact that Jesus commanded them to sail for the other side, they still ran into a storm. Because God has given you a command and things are not working out, it's not time to point the finger at God. It's not time to throw in the towel. It's not time to run away. It's time to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me in the middle of my storm. I want to tell you something good here. Satan always attacks those who are next in line for a breakthrough. Wait, wait, wait. Let me try this side. Let's, let's see if you're hearing what I'm saying. I said Satan always attacks those who are next in line for a breakthrough. Let me try this side. See if there's some light on this side. I said, Satan always attacks those who are next in line for a promotion. Yeah. Ooh, I like this side. I'll preach. You can go home. I'll just preach. No, don't, don't, don't do that. But in seriousness, ladies and gentlemen, when Satan knows you're headed for a breakthrough, he will always try to stop you. But I've got to move on. Point number two. Arabia is the next step on the journey. And we refer to this as the place of consideration. The fill in that blank. Consideration. Or even as the place of preparation. It's a place where you stop to consider or evaluate where you are on the journey towards your destiny. Things may have happened in your life that have shaken you up. 
And that's why you need Arabia. You now must consider the path forward. And ladies and gentlemen, we all have to come to Arabia. And we don't come to Arabia only once. We continually have to stop at Arabia and consider where we are so that we can prepare to where we have to go. And this is the time when you have to meditate on the Word of God to hear Him clearly. Because when you are in a state of uncertainty, there are many voices that speak to you. And those voices are confusing. You've got to come to Arabia. You've got to withdraw. You've got to take time to hear the Word of God. And let it not be the Word of man, but the Word of God. And let it be as Paul said, I did not preach what the apostles told me. I preached what the master told me. It's at Arabia that we have to consider the implication in all sincerity and devotion. Is it a good idea or is it a God idea? If it's a God idea, you can never shake it off. Uh, yeah, perhaps I just need to stop there for a moment, make that a little bit more clear. If it's a God idea, you can never shake it off. You can try to forget it, but it'll pop right back up. You'll dream about it. You go to bed, you'll think about it. You'll dream about it through the night. When you wake up in the morning, maybe the first thing you think about all during the day, you will try to shrug it off. You'll try to say, well, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I should do it. I don't know if it's really God or not God. This is when you know that it's God. It will not go away. It will stay with you. It will stay with you. You cannot shrug it off. And when you think you have shrugged it off, depression is going to take its place. And you're going to feel lonely and lost. It's here in Arabia that we've got to consider the implications and all of the sincerity in our devotion. In your notes... This moment was pivotal in Paul's life. When he surrendered to Christ, not only his will and actions changed, but also his thinking. His entire conviction position was turned around. There was so much for him to consider. I do believe that I can say to Every man and woman in this great congregation this morning, your thinking is what determines your life. What you think you will become. What you think about your church, it will turn out to become. Our thinking needs to change. There needs to be a metanoia. There needs to be a change of direction, a change of thinking. Our thinking must line up with the Word of God. Our thinking must line up with the will of God. Our thinking must line up with the Spirit of God. Our thinking needs to get in line. I do believe I'm speaking to somebody here when I'm saying to you, stop thinking the negative stuff. Let me try this slide again. I said stop thinking the negative stuff. The negative stuff will get you nowhere. The negative stuff will make you fail. The negative thinking will make you give in and throw in the towel. But today, in the name of Jesus, don't think the impossible. Think the possible. Shout to the Lord. Come on and give him praise. Tune your mind. Tune your mind. 
into positive thinking. Stop saying it won't work. Stop saying there's not enough money. Uh, that one I think I'm going to try on this side. I say, st stop thinking there's not enough money. Don't plan with the money in your pocket. Plan with the money in God's pocket. Uh, can I say this to you also? Don't plan with the money in your pocket. Plan with the money in God's pocket and begin to think possibility. That's when you're in Arabia. That's when you consider. That's when you prepare. And I said these moments are, were pivotal in his life. But many of the things that he believed in fanatically, he now had to reconsider. He readily had to accept that, that the Christ that he despised was truly the Son of God and the Redeemer of humankind. The things he opposed were now the things he had to embrace. Things he thought would never, he would never do, he now had to consider as being feasible. The very people he persecuted were now the people he had to embrace, to love, to teach, and nurture. Friends, if you want to walk in the will and the mind of God, in Arabia, at the place of consideration, you need to begin to forgive others. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But what I said over here is, is in his conversion moment, and his thinking changed. Suddenly, the people he hated now became the people he had to love. The people who hurt him were now the people he will have to embrace. We cannot continue to do the work of God until we've come to the place of Arabia where we are changing our hearts, our lives, and our minds. Sometimes we wonder why is it that the church is not growing and we blame the people and we blame the government and we blame COVID while the real problem is really in your mind. I, I'm in contact with many, many pastors across America and other parts of the world. And they often ask me the question, how do we get the people back after COVID? I'm spending all my time, all my energy, all my resources to get the people back after COVID. My answer is, if they are not back yet. They're not coming back. So stop spending your time and energy to try and get them back because God has sent back the faithful ones. Get together and get the new ones. I have made a calculation that all the people you have lost during COVID, you never had.
Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I've looked at a lot of statistics. In most cases in the Western world, including South Africa, the income in the churches did not go down. In many cases, the income went up. What does that say? The steady people, the people you had stayed. They kept on giving. They kept on believing. And when the doors opened, they came right back in because those are the people that we can build on for a great future for tomorrow. Oh, brother, but we cannot leave the people alone. Well, let's get on with this program. You're never going to get them back. Just find new people. When I look at this, I see that Paul apparently spent several years in the Arabian desert. In this place of consideration and preparation, Paul was willing, listen to me, he was willing to withdraw from everyone and everything to personally receive God's revelation for his life. In your notes, it took time, that's your word there, time. It took time for him to consider this momentous change in his life. And patience is the key word here. I said patience, that's your word. Patience is the key word. But please remember that patience is the weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. Woo, I've got to say that again. I don't want you to miss that. Patience is the weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. So don't despise the moment of patience because it's going to help you to see the reality of the deception. Verse 16b says, and when this happened, I did not rush out. After he had received the great revelation of Christ, he did not rush out and pitch a tent and begin to preach. Paul didn't try to organize a crusade. He didn't try to start a leadership institute. Instead, he took time to discover the deeper, your word, deeper things of God. He needed to make sure of his journey toward his destiny. He studied the aspects of the law and prophecy and the Old Testament over and over, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach and train him your words. Holy Spirit to teach and train him. He discovered more and more that Christ was the promised Messiah and the instructor. And from the time spent in Arabia, he gained the knowledge and insight to instruct and teach the churches in the New Testament. And to finally write all those powerful letters to the church. This is where we study deeply the full meaning of grace. Paul would not have been Paul without Arabia. And if we avoid Arabia, the place of preparation, we will never receive everything God wants for us. And I said it before, we do not stop at Arabia only once in our life. If you don't stop at Arabia, the place of consideration, fill in the blank, consideration, you will never fully know the will of God for your life. If you don't take the time to stop at Arabia, the place of consideration, you will continually walk in uncertainty and be prone to making wrong decisions. It's at the place of consideration where you determine that you are clearly hearing, hearing from God. And know that you are not persuaded by the emotions of others. 
It's here at Arabia where the clarion call is determined. Is your ministry involvement a career or you are, or are you driven by a divine call? The good news is you don't have to spend three years in Arabia. I don't know how long you will spend in Arabia. Paul spent three years. Yours may be three days, three months. I don't know. But this I do want to say, do not ignore your Arabia, your place of consideration. I want to close by this. Everybody look this way. Everybody look this way. In your Arabia is a place where you say, where am I? And where does God want me to be? In my consideration of the good and the bad, I have to know the will of God. And it's when I know the will of God and I have the confirmation in my spirit that I will be ready to take the next step. Let's move on. The third place that he stopped at is in Jerusalem. After having spent considerable time in Arabia, Paul then goes on to Jerusalem. Now, don't forget, Jerusalem used to be his headquarters. That's where he functioned from. That's where he went out to persecute the church. That's where he was very, very well known. That's where his financial support came from. Everything from Jerusalem. So everybody knew him. Then as Saul, the persecutor of the church. But now, as he's coming back to Jerusalem, he is a different man. He has a changed heart. He has is thinking differently. He's no longer, in your notes, he's no longer the hater of Christ or his church. He is no longer the enemy of the Christians. He's no longer the friend of those who sponsored him in cruelty. He now must explain, explain his position. He has to say to them, I have heard from God and now I'm constrained to go a different direction. Ladies and gentlemen, you can never make an announcement to the open and say, I am going a different direction until you have heard from God personally and directly so that when you make that declaration you can say it with conviction. What is Jerusalem? Jerusalem is the place of restitution. It's the place of restitution. Fill in that word. Jerusalem is the place of restitution. Restitution Restitution simply means righting the wrong you have done. Your word is wrong. Righting the wrong you have done. Straightening out the lies we have told. Healing the hurts that we have caused. But the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, that today restitution has become as unfamiliar to most people as fasting has become to the church. And I know and I realize that one of the most difficult things people must do is to go back and make restitution. But unless you have been to Jerusalem, the place of restitution, you will never be able to move forward toward your divine destiny. You will forever be anchored to unresolved soul ties of the past. You've got to make restitution. It's not easy to go back and tell people, I'm sorry. It's not easy to tell people, I was wrong. Please forgive me. 
but it's at Jerusalem where you, please listen to me, must cut the ropes that bind you to the past. I want to say that out loud to everybody. I don't have time to go one side and the other side anymore. I want to say to everybody, please listen to me. You have to cut the ropes that bind you to the past. Well, now definitely the side is shouting louder than the other. I think they spoiled. I said, you're going to have to cut the ropes of your past. Because for as long as you stay anchored to the hurts and pain of your past, you will never be able to reach your bright new tomorrow. You've got to let go. In your notes, you must let go go of your past hurts and pain and failure. You must forgive and let go. You must let go of those things that have hurt you deeply. And I don't know who it is that may have hurt you in your life. Could be a cheating spouse. Could have been an employer, a co-worker, a family member. Somebody may have abused you sexually, emotionally, physically. Could have been a father. Could have been a grandfather. Could have been a friend. And you were deeply hurt. And the problem is, most of the times, people cannot forget the past hurts and pain and failure. And they're not really ready to forgive those that have wounded them. And many times I would hear, hear people say, I will not forgive him or forgive her because when I let them go, or if I forgive them, it means I've let them go and they're free and I want to keep them in the bondage with my unforgiveness. And I want to keep them in prison with their unforgiveness and my unforgiveness. That's the way I'm binding them. That's the way I'm holding them down. But can I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, they are not the ones that are in prison. You are. You are suffering the pain. You are the one that's hurting. They're going on with their lives. They're jumping. They're dancing. They're singing. They're working. They're happy. They don't even know about your hurt and pain. And what are you doing? You're lying in bed, tossing and turning, sweating in your bed at night. And, and you say, I won't forgive. I won't forgive. And in the meantime, you are rehearsing your speech. And I'm going to tell him this. And, and I'm going to tell her that. And when he says, I'm going to say. And when she says, I'm going to say. And, and I rehearse my speech. And when I I get to the end of my speech, I start all over again. And the whole night I'm rehearsing my speech, tossing and turning. In the meantime, they're snoring. They're sleeping. They're enjoying a life. I'm saying to you today, in the name of Jesus, forgive them. Let them go. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping somebody else is going to die. If you cannot forgive, you cannot survive. I, uh, I've got to land this plane. I just briefly want to say this. It's in your notes. You've not only got to cut the rope of your past hurts and pain and failure, you've also got to cut the ropes of your past successes. Because too many people are so celebrating their past successes that they have lost their ability to dream about a new tomorrow. Listen to people. Oh, I wished you could have been here whenever. 
I wish you could have been here when evangelist so-and-so was here. I wish you could have been here when we had a revival. I wish you could have been here when we had a move of God. Oh, I wish you could have been here when we prayed all through the night. I wish you could have been here when God was present at every Oh, I wish you had been. But they're saying it like God died way back then. I'm telling you, God has not died. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Celebrate your past victories. Celebrate them. But get over it and begin to dream and cultivate a new dream that's ahead of your life. Final point is Syria. Now, when I say final point, it doesn't mean I'm going to close. Preachers have five closes. And I've not even reached my first one. But the final point. Syria is the final step or final stop on the journey. It says in verse 21, after that visit to Jerusalem, I went north into the province of Syria and Cilicia. So what are we talking about Syria? Syria is the place of ministry fulfillment. Ministry fulfillment. Once you have spent time at each of the previous strategic places, God releases you to enter the place of ministry fulfillment. The place where He wants you to be in this season of your life. To do what He wants you to do so that you can become what He wants you to become. There are so many people that are functioning in the ministry and they're not fulfilled. They're going through the motions, but everything is a pain. What must you do? How do you get to that place of fulfillment. How do you get to the place where you know you are where God wants you to be? You go to Jerusalem. You go to Jerusalem. You go to Arabia. You go to Syria. And it's in Syria, the place of consideration. That you begin to understand what it is that God wants you to do. That's when you move on. And you get to Syria, the place of ministry. You go first to Damascus. You move on from Damascus and you get to Arabia. You move on from Arabia and you get to Jerusalem. Until you finally come to Syria, the place of your ministry fulfillment. Because once you have spent time at each of these previous places, God releases you to enter the place of ministry fulfillment. The place where He wants you to be in this season of your life to do what He wants you to do so that you can become what He wants you to become. It's at Syria where your true identity is revealed. It's here where God's calling upon your life becomes clear and you understand why you had to follow the journey. The pain that you have experienced was not meant to destroy you. It was meant to shape you into the instrument God wants you to be. Because your pain is going to be somebody else's solution. 
Your tears are going to become somebody else's laughter. Your pain is that which is going to shape your heart and your spirit so that you can preach and teach and pray with the Spirit of Almighty God. Don't curse your pain, but walk the road until you get to your place of fulfillment. It's at Syria, again, where your true identity is revealed. It's here where God's calling upon your life becomes clear and you understand why you had to follow the journey. It's here where you realize that your provision, listen to me, it's here where you realize that your provision is at the place of your assignment. And when you reach your determined destiny, your place of fulfillment, the place where you know you should be, other people will clearly recognize God's affirmation and, with the, and rejoice with you. And verse 24 said, And they praised God because of me. When people know that you have found your place of fulfillment, they will see the joy of the Lord on your inside. They will experience the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They will experience the love of God when you've been at your place of fulfillment suddenly something is going to happen and the amazing thing is you may still at that point in time preach somewhat with a heavy heart but you know that you know that you know we are where God wants you to be and now when you preach the anointing destroys the yokes of bondages and people are being healed and set free by the power of God and suddenly your preaching is better you've not changed you don't think but you have because God has taken you on a journey and that's the time when you walk in the greatest victory of a great God and you can know that things have changed on your inside I'm here to tell somebody you're going to leave this place differently than you came I believe that something is about to stir on your inside I said there's something about ready to stir on your inside if that's you jump to your feet real quickly I'm to pray for you. If you want to be changed by the power of God, become a new person, a new preacher. I'm a little over my time. I apologize. I'll take just one more minute. But I wanted to say to somebody, it may be difficult to get out, up, up out of your seat. The years have gone along. But I want to say to you, in your old age, you are still going to bear fruit. I want to say to some that feel you are so young, you felt like you wanted to run around the building ten times while I was preaching. I'm going to say go for it, but come back again because God wants to use that energy to build the greatest church that we have ever seen to the glory of God. Now everybody lift your hands way high. Lift your hands way high. Now with your hands raised, your head raised, I want you to raise your voice and begin to pray in the spirit. I mean pray in the spirit. Come on. That's not good. You can pray louder than that. Come on. Lose your inhibitions here. Lose your inhibitions. Lift your voice. Walk away from religion today. Walk into the anointing. Come on. Pray a little louder. Pray in the spirit. Pray. Pray.
Tembre bebe vasoya. Power. Power. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Go, go, go. This is your moment. This is your moment. Don't miss it. Ye moroshi barabakoshe talarehe. Omorobo sabere rabahando robokotoi. Mandorehe. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for a mighty deluge of power to flood every heart, every life in the name of Jesus. Power! 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 